In this lesson, we're going to talk about listings, buyer brokerage agreements, and the Sherman Antitrust Act. So let's get started. First of all, let's define an employment contract. By law in Arizona, an employment contract is defined as an agreement hiring a broker to help purchase, lease, or sell real property for compensation. So what we're really talking about here is buyer brokerage agreements and listing agreements. And as we mentioned in another video, employment contracts cannot be assigned to third parties without all the parties' consent. So let's start our discussion here with listing agreements. A listing agreement, of course, is an agreement whereby a property owner hires a broker to find buyers for the property and agrees to pay the broker compensation or commission. One of the things I want to emphasize here, and it's in your course manual, is that a listing agreement is not, is not an agreement to sell the property. The seller is hiring the broker to find buyers and agrees to pay the broker a commission if the broker finds a buyer ready, willing, and able to buy the property at the terms of the listing. Now that just doesn't mean full price. That means full price, typically cash, no contingencies. And since most purchase contracts have financing contingencies and home inspection contingencies and other types of contingencies, uh, generally speaking, just bringing an offer at full price is not sufficient to satisfy the terms of the listing. But if a broker brought an all-cash offer at the exact price with no contingencies, then I would argue that the broker has met the seller's terms and conditions. And even if the seller said, I'm not going to sell, the broker would be entitled to his or her commission. Now, in the hierarchy of listings, there are three, and we're going to start with the lowest on the totem pole, that's the open listing, the most basic listing. So an open listing is a listing in which the seller agrees to pay the broker only if the listing broker finds a buyer. So let me set up an example. Let's say that you're a broker, you own your own brokerage firm, and there's of course a lot of other brokerage firms out there, and I hire you to find me a buyer for my property. And I say, Sally, Joe, whatever your name is, I'm going to pay you a commission if you find me a buyer, period. Now, what's expressed, and remember we got expressed versus implied relative to contracts, what's expressed there is that I'll pay you a fee if you find me a buyer. What's not expressed but implied is that I will not pay you a commission if another broker brings me a buyer or if I sell it myself. And that's generally speaking the way an, an open listing is interpreted. I'll pay you, the broker, a commission if you bring me a buyer. But if another broker brings me a buyer or if I sell it myself, I'm not going to pay you. I may pay the other broker, but I'm not going to pay you. And I could actually give two or three or ten or a hundred open listings. But open listings uh, are very rare. Years ago, 40, 50 years ago, they were pretty common. Today, they are relatively rare. Because a broker, to run a brokerage company and to do all the work associated with marketing a property, it costs money. It takes a lot of effort. And brokerage firms generally are not willing to list properties on an open basis. But the first type of listing I want you to keep in mind is an open listing. And a seller, of course, can give numerous open listings, as I mentioned. Now, the next type of listing is called an exclusive agency listing. And an exclusive agency listing, in it, the seller agrees to pay the broker a commission if any broker, if that broker or any broker finds a buyer. So let's take that same example. I want to hire you, and I like your style. So what I do is I say, I'm going to make you my exclusive agent. And any other agents out there have to all come through you. They all have to work with you, work with you or through you because you represent me exclusively. 
How, and I'll pay you a commission then if you bring me a buyer or any other broker brings me a buyer. But guess what? I still reserve the right to sell the property myself without paying you a commission. You know, I might be a small builder and have five or six homes for sale, and I still want to be, and I want to list them with you exclusively because I only want you to represent me, but I still want to negotiate directly with buyers. That might be a good example of an exclusive agency listing. So open listing, I'm only going to pay you if you find me a buyer. Exclusive agency listing, I'll pay you if you bring me a buyer or any other broker brings me a buyer. And by the way, when I say I'll pay you, you if another broker brings a buyer through you, then you have to, and that other broker will have to work out your commission arrangements between the two of you. So the seller can sell the property without paying the broker under an exclusive agency listing. The third type, and by far the most common, is called the exclusive right to sell listing. In an exclusive right to sell listing, I, the seller, take myself out of competition with you, the broker, because I'm going to pay you if you find me a buyer, if any other broker brings a buyer, and even if I sell it myself. So that's an exclusive right to sell listing, and of course it offers you, the broker, the most protection. On the other hand, with an exclusive right to sell listing, you're going to feel much more confident about going out and spending money and time marketing the property, looking for buyers, and so on. It also does protect the broker after expiration. In an exclusive right to sell, there is often a period of time after the listing expires, during which time the broker would be owed a commission in the event that the seller sold it directly to a buyer that had been shown the property by the broker during the term of the listing. So what are the three types of listings? Open listing, exclusive agency listing, and exclusive right to sell listing. Now there are some other types of listings or names that are given to listings. They're really not types. The first one is a multiple listing. And a multiple listing is really just a, an organization. It's a multiple listing service whereby brokers pool their listings and share the information so that many of the brokers, any of the brokers who are members of that service, can have access to that information. And if they have buyers looking for that type of property, they can bring offers through the listing broker. The second type is called a net listing. And this could take the form of an open exclusive agency or exclusive right to sell, but in a net listing, the seller agrees to take a net amount as proceeds and the broker can keep any portion of the sales price above that net amount as commission. So you can imagine a situation in which the buyer kind of had been living in a cave for the last 10 or 15 years and the buyer says, well, you know, said I paid 100000 for that property 20 years ago. If I could get 200000 for it, I'd be very happy. And the, the unscrupulous agent is thinking, wow, this guy's been uh, really ha doesn't have a clue, so I'm going to uh, list it or sell it for half a million dollars, guaranteeing the seller get 200000 and I'll keep the rest. So that's a way for an unscrupulous broker to take advantage of an unknowledgeable seller. And although net listings in Arizona are not illegal, they are frowned upon substantially. Now this next one, an option listing, is quite rare, and it's very simply a situation where the broker who has the listing has an option to buy the property. Uh, we rarely, if ever, see this, but just keep in mind that an option listing is a listing whereby the listing broker also has an option to buy the property. We've talked about listing agreements. Let's just take a minute here and talk about buyer brokerage agreements. A buyer brokerage agreement is an agreement between a buyer and a real estate broker whereby the buyer hires the broker to help the buyer find a particular type of property and agrees to pay that broker a commission should the broker be successful in finding that property. It's very rare that we see any agents marketing properties without an exclusive listing. It's quite common, however, that 
real estate agents show buyers property and bring buyers to properties without actually having a buyer brokerage agreement. Uh, the about 20 to 25 percent of real estate agents use buyer brokerage agreements in their practice. In this course, we're not going to get into them in any detail, but you have to make a decision once you become a real estate licensee as to whether or not you feel it's important to formalize your relationship with a buyer as opposed to simply becoming a taxi driver and a shower of properties. I can tell you with a certainty that if you don't use a buyer brokerage agreement, that buyers will be much less loyal to you. And one day you're going to find out while you're at your kid's soccer game that that buyer that you've been showing around town for the last week or two uh, bought a property at an open house on a Sunday afternoon through another agent. So ask yourself the question, do you want to formalize your relationship with a buyer? If you do, then you might want to consider utilizing buyer brokerage agreements. But they are typically exclusive agreements where the buyer hires you, in other words, one agent, one brokerage firm, to represent them in the acquisition of a property. Now, in either case, whether it's a listing or a buyer brokerage agreement, there's going to be a commission or some form of compensation. And commissions are totally agreed upon by the parties. What I want to emphasize is the law does not set commission rates. There's no maximum nor minimum on commissions. Obviously, there's a marketplace where different brokerage firms charge different amounts for their services, uh, but uh, you and your brokerage firm can charge whatever it is you choose. And that typically is a percentage of the sales price or purchase price, but it could also be a flat fee or you could charge an hourly fee or some other compensation arrangement. I do want to emphasize that you cannot accept compensation from both parties, let's say the buyer and the seller in a transaction, without both parties' written consent. The law requires that if you're receiving compensation from both parties or from more than one party, that you have to have those parties' written consent. Now, Listing agreements and buyer brokerage agreements must have expiration dates. Listing agreements are required and buyer brokerage agreements have an inception date and an expiration date. And a listing and a buyer brokerage agreement is deemed to expire at midnight of the final date of that agreement. So that's listings and buyer brokerage agreements. Now let's take a few minutes and talk about the Sherman Antitrust Act. This was enacted back in the late 1800s, and the antitrust legislation has been refined since then. The idea behind antitrust legislation is to prevent monopolies, is to prevent big operations from taking advantage of and forcing out of business these smaller operations. So, what does the Sherman Antitrust do, or how does it relate to real estate? Well, first of all, brokerage firms cannot come together and agree to fix prices. Now, I know a lot of people think that there's a regular commission rate, but there isn't. And if you do polls of brokers, yeah, most brokers probably charge a similar amount to other brokerage firms. But there are a number of brokerage firms that charge different rates, higher or lower than, uh, than other firms. The key is that brokerage firms cannot come together and agree to fix commissions to set commission rates. Now within a brokerage firm, the company can say we will charge this amount and its salespeople and associate brokers will have to abide by that. But there are many brokerage firms that actually allow the salesperson or associate broker to set their own commission rates or negotiate those rates uh, in individual transactions. Keep in mind, brokers cannot agree to fix prices, meaning fix commission rates. Another thing the Sherman Antitrust Act prohibits is that you can't say commissions are non-negotiable. Uh, you can't argue or, or inform a seller or a buyer, well, look, we all charge the same thing. It's non-negotiable, right? Because as a matter of fact, commissions are totally negotiable. Another thing the Sherman Antitrust Act says is that brokers can't agree to divide the city between them. 
this would be anti-competitive. Okay, so you take the west side, I'll take the north side, and you guys take the east and the south side. That's tantamount to eliminating or an attempt to eliminate competition, especially if there are larger firms that are agreeing to divide the city up into those areas. The Sherman Antitrust Act also prohibits brokers from boycotting other companies' listings. Historically, there have been startup real estate companies who have reduced commission rates and offered smaller co-op fees to cooperating brokers on their listings. And what we have seen is we've seen some companies and some agents getting together and boycotting that company's listings in order to basically put them out of business. All right, so boycotts against real estate companies, for whatever the reason, uh, would be a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. And one of the questions that sometimes comes up is, can I place a lien on a property if the seller or the owner doesn't pay me a commission? And the answer is probably not, except in one circumstance, and that is in the leasing of commercial property. Now, in a sale, the seller who might owe you the commission doesn't own the property any longer, so there's no way you could keep a lien or place a lien on the buyer's property. But in a commercial lease which might be a five or a 10 year lease, the owner who agreed to pay you the fee should you bring a, a tenant still owns the property. And in Arizona, the law does allow uh, for a lien on a commercial property where the broker was not paid uh, a leasing commission or the agreed to a leasing uh, commission. Uh, now the law's rather specific, the broker has to go through a number of steps, so it's not always a slam dunk. But knowing this, if you're in commercial leasing, you should be familiar with the law relating to being able to place a commission lien on a property. So that does it for our discussion on listings, buyer brokerage agreements, and the Sherman Antitrust Act. 